Welcome Dynamics students for our first lecture in Particle Kinetics. So if you've been studying Dynamics so far, uh, you've probably covered Particle Kinematics, which is the study of the motion of a particle, and a particle being something that is small enough that it has no size, in, it, in that it is small enough that it can't support any moment. Uh, so it can be treated as uh, being in equilibrium if the sum of the forces in, is in equilibrium. So uh, kinematics is distinguished from kinetics in that for kinematics we're only concerned with how something moves. So we'll know the acceleration and then uh, look at what we have to do to get velocity and position subject to certain initial conditions. In kinematics we turn our focus to what was it that caused that acceleration in the first place, which is forces and moments. So we're going to start out with what uh, hopefully everyone is pretty familiar with and that is Newton's laws. So we're going to start with uh, just a quick review of Newton's three laws related to particles. So first we have Newton's first law, the sum of the forces acting on a particle, otherwise known as the force resultant, and of course forces are vectors, uh, is zero, then the particle has a constant velocity. So that's another way of saying that it is at rest. So it can actually be stationary, or it can be traveling at a constant speed in a straight line. So, because we all remember from our kinematic studies, if something is in a curved path, it has, even if it's going at constant speed tangent to that path, it's going to have an acceleration component normal to the path. So, if something's moving on a curvy path, uh, something's accelerating it, and it would need a force to do that. So, if we don't have a zero force resultant, we have a non-zero force resultant, then the magnitude and direction of the force resultant is proportional to the time derivative of the particle's momentum. The particle's mass times its velocity, which is a vector. So that's a little bit different form that a lot of us may be used to seeing it in. We're used to the sum of the forces is the mass times the acceleration. This is actually equivalent as we'll see below, and thinking of, of force and moment resultants as being the time derivative of momentum, either a particle or a rigid body, is a very convenient way of thinking that we'll follow through throughout the rest of this course. And you'll, you'll see again with angular momentum uh, being the sum of the moments about a particle or particle system, and then analogs to rigid bodies for full bodies that can support moment in a single body. And last but not least, we have Newton's third law. The interaction of two particles is through a pair of self-equilibrating forces. That means they're going to assume a magnitude and direction that they need, such that they have the same magnitude and line of action opposite direction. So this is another way of saying that the internal forces in a, in a particle system that's in contact or otherwise interacting um, is going to cancel out. And we only have to look at the sum of the external forces, these two. Uh, to see if that system will, is going to move at a different speed <laughs> or in a different direction. Okay, little review of the two forms of Newton's second law. So if we have an F sub R is in this case is the sum of the forces or the force resultant, the resultant vector is the time derivative of momentum as we stated above. So that's the first time derivative of M times V. If we are working with constant mass, which is going to be the case for any time we have non-relativistic -relativ speeds, which is pretty much everything in this course. Mass is a constant, comes out of the derivative, and we just have mass times the first time derivative of velocity, which is acceleration. So F equals MA is analogous to F equals first time derivative of, in this case, linear momentum. There'll be an angular momentum analog to this with moment. Okay, the next step is to say, okay, this is great for particles. If I've taken physics, I already know this. So what's new with dynamics? Eventually, we are going to want to apply these things to rigid bodies. Uh, we're going to want to apply it to any kind of body, but we'll start with rigid bodies. So we're going to pull in Euler's law, which you may have seen in statics. Um, but it's, it is, uh, concerns itself with, with bodies as opposed to just single particles. So that really expands our, our repertoire of what we can do with this, which is what's useful. So Euler's first law says that a force resultant uh, versus time dependent momentum change, or it relates force resultants versus time dependent momentum change for a body. 
just like Newton's second law for a particle. So not reading it verbatim there. So this should look pretty familiar. Again, we have force result and result of all external forces, this time on a body equals D capital L vector vector form uh, with DT. So L is the, the linear momentum of a full body, you know, car, a train, a blob of water, because this particular law applies to all bodies, rigid, deformable, and even non-solids. And in fact, we will apply the integral version of this in our study of impact momentum, uh, excuse me, impulse momentum, to look at diverting a stream of water. So definitely any, any kind of body. And the one caveat is we have to take that time derivative in the inertial reference frame. So this says, hey, I can apply something that looks exactly like Newton's second law for particles to any body, any body. So first time derivative of linear momentum of the full body uh, is going to be equal to my force resultant. So how do I put that to use? How do I find the linear momentum of a body? I don't know how to do that. It's not just mv, is it? kind of, some of it, and that's what we're going to get to next. How do we relate the linear momentum of a body to our, our known and loved mv for a particle? So let's take a look at a body out in, in space somewhere versus an inertial reference frame. So an inertial reference frame is one that is not accelerating. So um, basically we tend to use the Earth as an inertial reference frame for a lot of our, our dynamics problems. In reality, if you were looking at celestial mechanics, it wouldn't be because it is moving. Um, you're moving at a very, very fast velocity here as the Earth spins. Um, wouldn't have to worry about that if you weren't in like the reference frame of the Sun. So when when a law or a rule in dynamics is stated as applying only from the perspective of an inertial reference frame, it means that all of your radius vectors, your distances, your velocities are taken with respect to something that is not itself accelerating. So that's all it means. So we have point O in reference frame F. That's a squiggly F. So this is kind of, this is our reference point. So we got this body out here somewhere, and we're going to draw a radius vector. This doesn't have an arrow, but this is a radius vector from point O to a differential mass bit, dm, somewhere in the body. So if it had a constant density, this would be rho times dv, and that would depend on the shape of the body. But that differential mass bit is a point. So we can treat that like a particle. So if we wanted to apply Newton's second law to just that little differential bit of mass, no problem. Force resultant is equal to the velocity of that little differential mass bit times the dm of the mass, time, first time derivative, no problem. Um, and by the way, the velocity of that mass bit with respect to O in our inertial reference frame here is given by V is just the first time derivative of the position vector, right? So the faster this r radius vector, position vector changes with time, the greater the velocity. So definition of velocity, time rate of change of position. So we've got everything we need to define linear momentum of this little mass bit. OK. Well, we could define. And, and, and kind of uh, see that the, that the mo linear momentum of the whole body, L, is just the linear momentum of all of those little mass bits added up over the whole body, B. We could just integrate the velocity of each mass bit with respect to point O, with, you know, times the, the mass of the mass bit, dm, and just add that up over the whole body. And if we had some kind of of a function that allowed us to integrate this, uh, we could come up with a single value. So for certain well-defined shapes, we could probably do that. Well, let's take a look at, let's do some substitution and see if we can find something familiar that we already know that might help us treat this, this body like a particle. We already said that velocity is equal to the time rate of change of position with respect to O, so d big R dt. So let's just insert that in the integral and rewrite it. So the linear momentum of our body, capital L, is the time integral of dr dt 
dm. Okay, now we got we got two differentials in here. We've got time and mass. Well, mass isn't changing with time. We already said that on the last page. So we can rewrite this integral to integrate the entire integral here with respect to time because the dm is like a constant with respect to time. So we can we can rearrange the integral without changing the intent without violating the mathematics that we were expressing or the concepts we were expressing with our mathematics, excuse me. Well, now this should look like something that's kind of familiar. Um, the integral over a whole body of the radius vector from a given reference point added up over the whole mass is equal to the mass of the body times the radius of vector from that same reference point to the center of mass. This is, this is one part, this is usually the numerator part of the definition of center of mass. This would have like a, a integral over the body of just dm in the denominator. So this is the kind of the top half of the center of mass and if we multiplied it by the mass of the whole body m we could just replace this whole integral with m times the position vector of the center of mass. Nice! Ah, oh, we're getting closer to a particle now. So the linear momentum of the body is the time derivative of the mass of the body which we, we can probably figure out times the radius vector from a reference point to the center of mass, which is another way we can take mass out of that differential. And so now we just have the first time derivative of the position of the center of the math mass with respect to time. First time derivative of the position of the center of mass with respect to time is the velocity of the center of mass in that same inertial reference frame with respect to that point O. V sub C, we'll call it, velocity of the center of mass with reference to point O. We can take a second time derivative and get dl dt, kind of like we had up here, which we could equate to a force, uh, a force resultant that maybe we could find from a free body diagram. Something, something more solvable. So we can take the first time derivative here, get velocity. Now we, we are equating linear momentum of a body to linear momentum of what can be treated like a particle, the center of mass of that body. We can take another time derivative and get dl dt and equate that to m d squared position of the center of mass dt squared, second time derivative of the center of mass position which is the same thing as acceleration or a sub c, acceleration of the point of the center of mass. All right, so what we've said now is by doing, doing what we did is we can take a whole body, rigid, deformable, whatever, and from the point of view of Euler's first law, we can equate the force resultant on that body to the mass of the body times the linear acceleration of the center of mass of the body. Now, if the body's rotating, that follows different rules. But right now, we're talking linear acceleration. That's big L. There's a different symbol for angular acceleration of a body. That'll be big H. We'll see that in some upcoming sections. But if we're looking at translational motion, something's moving in a straight line, but now we can change its speed in whatever direction it's going. We can actually have it going, if it's not ro it's self-rotating, we can even have it going on a curvilinear path but we can have a whole body moving kinetically, <laughs> kinema excuse me, kinematically, um, and treat it at its, treat its center of mass the way we would a particle. Um, and of course, because the center of mass is just a particle, things like rotating, if you're a singularity, you're just a single point, doesn't make a lot of sense. So anything having to do with a body rotating uh, kind of on its own axis or around another axis, doesn't apply to this particular definition. This is only for linear motion, but that does constitute quite a bit of motion. So we can do an awful lot with that. So since the center of mass is such an important uh, an important point, we're gonna we're gonna take a little bit of time and do a few examples of center of mass just to get a little bit of practice back. If you if if it, it has been a while since you took statics or physics or any course where you had to calculate that, um, this is just a, a really quick dive into finding centers of mass.
So we start back with a quick overview of the definition. The radius to the center of mass from some reference point is equal to 1 over the mass of the whole body times the integral over the whole body's mass of a radius vector from your reference point to any mass bit integrated with respect to mass. So the trick, um, as you probably remember from centroid, is finding a radius vector and mass element combination uh, that, that work well together so that you can, you can execute the integral. So we've got a cone uh, that's got its axis perpendicular to the, or excuse me, parallel to the z-axis. And so we have an r uh, base of the cone radius, and the cone is, is of a height h. This is not showing up very well, but the, the total height from the tip of the cone to the, to the base point is h. So we can get a relationship between um, using h and r to relate um, any, any increment of radius to any increment of height. We can now use that relationship, which we'll use uh, to achieve our integral. We have a relationship between the radius of the cone at any z position to that z position. Think of it as method of slices going um, perpendicular to the z-axis, if you remember old calculus integrals. Okay, uh, we're in a Cartesian coordinate system, so our radius vector is given by, you know, basically how far you went out in each direction, you know, x in our i hat direction, y in our j hat direction, z in our k hat direction. Because this is an axis symmetric part, we're going to want to work in cylindrical coordinates because we can define this mass element super easy. We have density, uh, which in this case we're assuming is constant. But if this were a function of any one of these three variables, we'd have, a, we'd have some function of them sitting here. And then r d theta dr dz is, is the kind of volume element in cylindrical coordinates. So you multiply that by density and you have your dm mass element. So that mass element is sitting somewhere out there at x i hat plus y j hat plus z k hat. Um, but now we need x and y in terms of r and theta so we can we can actually solve the integral z uh, our k hat direction is the same in cylindrical as in spherical or excuse me as in cartesian coordinates so that stays so we can just use some some geometry some trig to get our, uh, our x in terms of r and theta so x equals r cosine theta which makes y equal to r sine theta so now we can express our our r radius vector to our mass element all in in uh, cylindrical coordinates and we're going to pull this relationship in as a limit of integration so here we go we're going to start with our total mass not mess around with the with the r first gives us a warm up of applying our limits so the mass of the cone is going to be the integral over the cone of the mass of any little element so there's our mass element and we can pull density out we're assuming it's constant so we're going to integrate z from 0 to the height from 0 all the way over to h and we're going to integrate r from 0 to whatever the the highest r you know is as a function of z so if we were doing r by itself we would just say from 0 to r uh, we we know that r is a function of z so we're going to use the the expression of 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 radius as a function of z here instead of r just instead of capital r and then theta, of course, gets integrated all the way around the circle, 0 to 2 pi. So if we evaluate the integral, we start, we can start with theta. You know, we pop out a 2 pi, and now we're going to integrate r dr between 0 and, and r z over h. We get a squared term, input our upper limit. So we can take out the constants r and h. We're left with a z squared. Uh, from the z coming in here, and then we end up inputting 0 to h, and so we get pi r squared h over 3 times the density, so that's that's our mass. So now if we want to integrate with 
um, with the radius vector in, we've got this same expression, but we're going to have our, our r equals xi hat plus yj hat plus ck hat with x as r cosine theta and y as r sine theta. So here's the, the center of mass integral uh, in terms of, of 1 over m times, again, here's our Here's our integral written out as, as the integral of a sum is the sum of the integrals broken out. So each vector direction gets its own integral to make it a little bit easier and easier to write. So these are each evaluated if you follow the wavy line. Um, the integral for each one is written out. So here's our, our x, our i hat direction. Uh, so this, this will be how far you go over in the i hat direction to find uh, the center of mass. So we evaluate the integral the same way, except in this case, instead of just just um, just our our row for density, we now have the r squared cosine theta term in. You evaluate that integral and you get zero, which is pretty good because <laughs> it's a good check uh, because you know that the center of mass should be at zero zero x y. It's really the z position that's the challenge. So. Uh, if we do the same thing for uh, for the j hat coordinate, we also get a zero, and so the real challenge, of course, is our is our z. So our z, we have our our r dm is equal to z r d theta dr dz. Crank through the integral using the same limits, and we end up with our our z sub c as uh, three quarters h. So, much closer to the base, which is exactly what you would expect. So, this should be hopefully getting you thinking again about center of mass and how to work through the integrals. The big trick, again, is expressing your position vector and your dm, your mass element, in some kind of terms that can be integrated together. And then using any kind of other relationships you need to express your limits. And then, of course, remembering integrate one variable at a time, holding the others constant. A very important trick, which flows out of the definition of center of mass and the properties of integrals of sums, is the method of composite parts. Uh, there's going to be analogs to these when we start looking at moment of inertia um, that rely on the same thing. But right now, we're just we're just reviewing center of mass, so I'm giving a glimpse ahead. So we have, uh, in this case, a cylinder in a sphere, and somebody wants to know what the center of mass of the two-part body is. Well, they're separate bodies, but you know they want to know the center of mass of the whole thing, maybe as if they were welded together. If you were to try to integrate this, this would be some terribly complex function to include the sphere and the cylinder. But instead, we can use the method of composite parts which says that our, our, the total mass times the radius from your, your reference point, which we've put here at the end of, this, of the cylinder, uh, equals basically the integral um, of the radius to each part divided by their total mass contribution, or their individual mass contributions. So in this case, we'd have you know, the integral from of, for the of the radius from the origin to the mass element of every bit of mass element over the whole composite part is the sum of that same integral of just the cylinder plus just the sphere. If we divided by the total mass contribution, the total mass we would end up having in each case thrown out a mass of the individual parts, and that's where you get your your mass ratio over this a little bit fast. So what we can do is we can find the center of mass with respect to the origin of each of these parts and then add them up ratioing their individual masses. So we can get a total mass um, just knowing basically formulas for um, for volume of a cylinder in a sphere. Let's see, let's make sure we were told these are uniform. Both bodies have the same uniform density. So we don't have to mess around with, uh, with an uneven density or differential density. So basically, we're going to have um, 
our four thirds pi r cubed for the sphere, and then we'll have pi r squared times five r for the cylinder. Total mass. So we can write that out in terms of each coordinate direction. So I'm just stepping through my notes here. So this expression on the left hand side is the coordinates for the center of mass, which is the same as centroid in this case, hence the bars uh, for the total system in each direction is equal to, and I've divided the mass total over, cylinder mass divided by total mass times the the centroid or center of mass, same, same, same in this problem, for the cylinder plus the mass ratio of sphere to the total mass and then times the centroid location x and y of the sphere. So how did we get the centroid location of the cylinder? x and y uh, is definitely going to be 0 in the y because we're going to want to stay on the axis of the cylinder and then we're going to go halfway down the cylinder. It's uniform density so the cylinder is 5 r long. Our x centroid is going to be at 2 and a half. So that's 2 and a half here and 0. The sphere is going to have an x-centroid at its center point. <laughs> Basically, it's going to have its own, its own centroid will be at its, its center point. And so the centroid versus the, the origin here is basically going to be the location of the sphere center point versus the origin. So in the x direction, it's going to be one r up and then another r up. Or excuse me, in the y. It's going to be 2r up and then the x it's going to be 4r so the, the x coordinate of where the center of the sphere is. So if I put and the, here we have it with the arrow showing that that's where it's being inserted in the formula 4r and 2r. So if we just crank through and retaining uh, collecting terms for each coordinate direction and ratioing the total masses, we can get a, a radius vector from the origin point at 2.82 r i hat plus 0.421 r j hat. So somewhere, somewhere right around here. Somewhere, no, part way, a little bit further, a little bit lower. So somewhere, somewhere kind of right in the corner where my, my hand-shaped pointer is, which looks reasonable from an eyeballing because the, the sphere is, has definitely pulled that center of mass up. So important review, definition of the method of composite parts. We leverage the, the integral of a sum as the sum of the integrals property to write an expression for the total, the center of mass of the total composite part. Remember that is the integral of RDM total times the total mass. And so that's, that is the, the equal to the sum of the integrals of, for the center of mass times the mass of each of the composite parts divide through by mass total. And then if it's simpler to get the center of mass for each of the composite parts, which it always will, um, you can just simply add those. And remember, of course, given that you probably will be working in more than one direction, remember to all, always add each uh, coordinate direction uh, to like coordinate direction. So in this case, I collected all the terms, all the I hats add to I hats and J hats add to J hats. Okay. Last center of mass review. Um, this is probably something just a little bit newer. I had mentioned that um, Euler's first law applies to deformable bodies as well as rigid bodies. So we're going to look at calculating the center of mass of a rigid body before and after it's deformed. And in this case, we have a, uh, a bar with a length of 2L. So it's extended out in the Y direction. And before deformation, it has a uniform density. And so the center of mass is not so, in the, we're assuming it has negligible thickness in the y direction. So before uh, deformation has uniform density, center of mass is at x equal L, or L in the i hat direction right in the middle. 
excuse me, and then someone deforms the the um, the rightmost end of it and compresses it, so it's it's half uh, half the length, and it gains density. So basically, we've compressed the right half, so it's half its original length, no change in cross-sectional area, uh, so it's gained in density. In which case, it's it's doubled in density. So that's that's the important part to remember. This time, we we don't have uniform density anymore due to the deformation. Uh, the left hand side for reasons that I, I don't know are unaffected maybe somebody grabbed it halfway and so the compressive force was only applied to the right half so someone wants to know how has the center of mass changed in the x direction uh, center of mass due to the deformation is it is it still at, at x equals l or has it shifted and if so how much so we can go ahead and tackle this again using using a double uh, a composite integral so we're going to say the the radius from our origin over on the left hand side to the center of mass of the new part it's one over the total mass integral over the whole rod times the density times x dm uh, which is dv rod because we already have density so it would be x times density times dv rod Okay, says centroids on the x-axis. We're, you know, we know that centroid and the other two are, are at zero. So we're only looking. We're only really concerned with the x. Making sure I'm not skipping anything, any important points here. Okay, so center of mass. The part is basically we just. To get the center of mass of the whole part in all three orthogonal directions, we only need to find the x. Okay. We know that the, the total mass didn't change from the undeformed. We didn't lose any mass, so our our m total here is easy. It's the it's the cross-sectional area times twice the length times the density. So that's basically density times v. So we have that. And before deformation, we can we can do a practice calculation and uh, and put this in as one over m, and we can calculate this integral from zero to two l, and get this expression evaluated at zero uh, and and two l, and we can end up with l. So that's reassuring since we could see that by observation. After deformation, we're going to use basically a composite part. So we're going to look for the center of mass of the undeformed portion, which is this left-hand expression in parentheses. So we have area times the integral from 0 just to L. So we're going to in integrate from 0 just to here of this body, find its center of mass, which not surprising, better be at L over 2. So we're going to have x rho dx, and by integrating only from 0 to L, we're only taking that you know half of the bar then we're going to add that to the area cross-sectional area is unchanged a in both cases and we're going to integrate the new doubled density to rho x dx from l to 3l over 2 and so this is with reference again to the origin not from l over not from from 0 to l over 2 but from L to 3L over 2 because everything is we're referenced back to the origin so our limits of integration are effectively defining the length over which we're going to integrate um, the X position times the mass of our new of our new bar so we just integrate uh, with respect to X and we end up getting uh, 5 times the area rho L, L squared over 4 and of course we have our area L squared L over 2 here divide through by the total mass 2AL rho and we get 7 eighths L so we did change the the center of mass by 1 eighth of the length so it shifted from here to a little shy of there so we have the same mass can think about it you had the same mass in this bar you didn't take any away but you moved more of it closer to the origin so the center of mass of the composite body uh, was closer to the origin 
So this is a nice example of the method of composite parts used to deal with density differences. So if you have an area in a, in a single monolithic body that has different densities, no problem. If you know where those density regions are, you can just break the integral up into, into the sum of your radius vector from your point of reference to whatever mass point that has that density. You just have to be able to define that region with limits of integration like we did here. Okay, that is it for this lecture. So just to recap, what did we do? We reviewed Newton's three laws of motion for particles. We admitted that someday we'd really like to move things other than particles and that we're looking ahead towards bodies. We invoked Euler's first law that says the time rate of change of, mom of linear momentum, capital L, of any body, rigid or not, is equal to the force resultant. We admitted we'd really like to apply that sooner than later to bodies and we found a way to equate the linear momentum of a body to the center, the moment, the linear momentum of the center of mass of that body and in so doing we got, gave ourselves an ability to treat a body as just a point at its center of mass for the point of view of movement, um, translational movement. We're not because it's just a point at the center of mass, we're not able to use that to look at how the body is rotating, but we can look at any kind of translational motion, straight line motion or curvilinear motion. No rotation yet, but plenty of motion ahead of us. And we followed with a quick review of definition of center of mass, how to calculate it, and a little recap of the method of composite parts for both separate physical parts and parts with multiple densities. So we'll pick up from here and use our newfound discovery of, of body movement, uh, translational movement via its center of mass and apply Newton's laws and Euler's first law to some real bodies.